The Path to Authenticity is brought to you by GIA Miami. Founded by world-class mental health experts, GIA provides advanced care for difficult-to-treat conditions, including anxiety, medication-resistant depression, and obsessive-compulsive disorder. Using state-of-the-art methods, GIA can help people recover from conditions when more traditional approaches can't. Dr. Antonello Bonchi has assembled an expert team serving international clientele in a modern and resplendent Miami setting. If you or someone you love is suffering from depression, anxiety, OCD, or other mental health concerns, call GIA at 833-713-0828. You can learn more about GIA by clicking the link in the show notes or by visiting GIAMiami.com. Thank you for listening to The Path to Authenticity. My name's Tom Gentry. I think of this show as the opposite of small talk. You'll hear real conversations with real people who know who they are. We talk about what makes them who they are, how they became who they are, and how we might become truer expressions of who we are. I'm Lisa Cleary, and this is The Path to Authenticity. your first time here. Thanks for checking it out. If not, thanks for coming back. I'm Tom Gentry, and this is The Path to Authenticity, episode 201 for November 15th, 2022. This episode features a conversation with the author Lisa Cleary. Just want to mention I lost a friend of mine a few days ago. His name's Paul Taylor, and uh, just a sad loss. He's a colleague and a friend, and uh, we had a lot of great conversations over the years. And One of the things he said to me, he was talking about his own personal experience as a person in recovery, and he said, you know, I wasn't sticking a needle in my arm at 13 years old because everything was okay. And the point being that as alcoholics, drug addicts, we all have a history that led us to be who we are. I've never really gotten too caught up in the genetic aspect of addiction Is there something to be said for that? Probably. I think there's research out there that verifies that. But there are definitely environmental factors. So just wanted to mention my friend and honor him. Great guy, Paul Taylor. Anyway, hope you enjoy this episode. Here you go, Lisa Cleary. Lisa, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited. Uh, well, I'm glad you're excited. I was very happy to uh, to connect with you and to have you come on the show. And of course, I got your book and started to read that. And I almost feel like I know you a little bit after, you know, I, I mentioned to you in some of our correspondence, I think it must have been an Instagram message or something that your voice really comes through. And it's very endearing and warm and genuine. And, uh, that's not easy to achieve. That's, that's a skill and, you know, a talent. So I applaud you for that. I admire your, your, the way how clearly you express your voice. 
Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. I try to write where it's accessible. And as a writer, I feel like sometimes I've read different things where it can come off maybe preachy or it can come off where someone's trying to teach you something. And so when I write, I try to have someone experience that with me or go through that with me. And the best way that I write is to make people laugh at me and entertain Mm -hmm. them. So I feel like that's always the most successful um, and people will learn better from that or really better. So I appreciate that. I appreciate you reading it for sure. Thank you. So tell us about your book. Sure. So the book is called How to Survive a Breakup When All of Your Friends Are Birthing Their Second Child. So I know that sounds like a very long and funny title, but to give background on that, again, I am a self-help writer and I was writing for different media outlets. And when I was 31, I went through a long-term breakup. I moved out of a shared apartment and I was also laid off from my job. So it was extremely ironic at the time that suddenly I'm a self-help writer telling people how to live their life or encourage them what to do to live their best life. And then suddenly I'm single, um, having never been married. I was homeless. I didn't have a place to live and also jobless. So I was kind of, I was stuck. And what I did write about was that with finances, I knew that I would try to get a job, get back on my feet, get an apartment. And, you know, the same with my career. But the tough thing was with relationships, that's the one thing that's hard to control because you can't control that other person, whether it's dating, sometimes with relationships, marriages. And, you know, I really had a hard time being single because I had been in a relationship for so long, especially at a time when all my friends were getting married. And having their kids. So I wrote the book as really just kind of in a joking, self-deprecating sense that like, oh, shoot, how do you survive a breakup when it seems like you're moving 10 steps back? And so that's really the premise of the book. It's not that, oh, this is the worst thing ever, but it's, you know, how do you survive it? Mm -hmm. Um, It's not the worst thing in life, but it's certainly hard when you feel like you're on the opposite spectrum. So I wrote it from that stance. Yeah. You know, um, I had another author on a few months ago, um, and she wrote a memoir about having a, you know, lifelong marriage, but never having had children and talked a lot about just how you kind of feel like an outsider among your friends who do have children and you kind of feel like you're not part of this club. And it's kind of that way as well when you're single and all your peers are married. It's like, you know, do they really want to hear about my little breakup when, you know, she's breastfeeding or whatever it is, you know, and it's uh, it's it's easy to feel isolated when you get to that place in life. And I'm sure that you probably experienced that some, right? Yeah, I did. And, you know, at 31, not having been married and not having kids, um, although I do want, welcome and want both, but when the time's right for me and when I'm in a healthy um, relationship and so on. Um, but I certainly experience kind of this curiosity around me, like at that age when you're not married and you've never been married, it's kind of like, well, you know, are you putting yourself out there or what's wrong with you? Are you being too picky? And these questions really stem from when a woman is at a certain age, let's say over 30 and she's single. Um, there is a stigma to that. And I certainly did feel that because people in many ways encouraged me to settle down, encourage me to be in that relationship, to have children. But very rarely do people encourage others to be happy. And I thought that that was a very interesting concept, you know, in self-help, but just something that I myself experienced. And, you know, the other thing is, like I said, I 
I, it's, it's interesting because people, and again, from my experience, they equate someone's self-worth or their success, especially for females with being married and with mm-hmm. having children. And there's nothing wrong with not being married. There's nothing wrong with not having children. And so that was definitely a, just a curious concept that I tried to maneuver through. And especially with not being married, um, people don't always take a breakup as seriously, although it can be just as rough as a divorce. Although I, you know, I see that not having been through one and it sounds juvenile. It feels juvenile. And that's also kind of the, the premise again of the book. So I definitely did experience that, but more so that people wanted me to be happy. But again, happiness can be found in, in a lot of other ways. Mm. Well, and one of the things I talk about on this show quite a bit is we're not really all that great in our culture with teaching each other how to be in relationships. We're just not. And, um, and I think personally, I believe that's because we don't focus more on personal happiness because if I'm not happy and I join lives with you, that isn't going to make me happy. That's just going to make me an unhappy partner. Um, and, and people don't necessarily think about that, but you know, there's a saying in my world that when it comes to relationships, two halves don't make a whole. And I think we're heading more in that direction in our society where people are more focused on happiness. Don't you? Yes. And no, um, I think that it's important and it definitely has been that focus on mental health. Um, and I think that that's great, but I think that the way and I'm saying this as an umbrella, but the way we define happiness, I don't think that that's necessarily something that's that I see as a healthy route either. I, I still do see a lot of happiness being defined as milestones. And I experience that just in everyday conversation too. So I try to reframe that, you know, with friends um, in the past that they would discuss, oh, who are you dating or et cetera. Um, I would try to reshift that conversation that, oh, dating might not be my priority, but here's what I'm working on at work. And that's been right. making me happy. So relationships aren't necessarily, you know, the, the tell all, although certainly everyone wants to believe in true love and that that does equate happiness. But I try to emphasize that, you know, with single people or people who have gone through divorces, that many of my friends who have been divorced are the happiest mm. out of because I'm they've then learned their boundaries right. and their self-worth, but they had to go through the lowest point. So I guess it, I, I would say yes and no. It's a, it would be a complicated, complicated answer for that. Well, have have you heard of uh, the author, Sean anchor? He wrote a book called the happiness advantage. I, you know, I, I have not, I will check that out. He, uh, he teaches at Harvard I believe if I'm not mistaken, unless that has changed, but I think they have a whole school at Harvard that studies happiness. And there's also a, uh, he's got a, uh, Ted talk as well that, you know, is based on the same concept of the book. And that's that as a society, as a culture, we really have, the idea of how we achieve happiness really backwards um, because we tend to look at it like the carrot dangling in front of us. What's that next thing that, you know, be it um, marriage or a promotion or the next promotion or owning your own business, you know, there's always something more there's the, and we're not, happy because we're successful. The opposite is true. We're successful because we're happy. And that's why the book's called the happiness advantage. There's a whole field of study out there about how this works. We need more happiness. I just, part of the reason why I wanted to do this podcast 
was because I think there are so many people who are unfulfilled personally. And we all deserve to have what we want and to be who we want to be. And um, I just think the world would be a much better place if more of us were doing what we wanted to be doing with our lives. And we'd probably be easier to love. Yeah, I definitely think so. I think that there's a lot of pressures, um, you know, again, and I say this for females to get married at a certain age, um, to have children by certain ages. And a lot of times, and I've been guilty of that in the past with past relationships, you stay in something that's unhealthy because that's expected. And is being single the worst thing? That used to be my worst fear. And that sounds so childish, but that was my mentality years and years ago. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, no, being unhappy should be your worst fear. It should be my worst fear because life is so short. And so if you're in an unhealthy relationship, um, for me, it was best to walk away from that. And so my, my thing that I always say is, it, it surprises me when we congratulate people walking down the aisle or a woman's first step down the aisle, but we don't always congratulate that woman who walked away from a toxic relationship. So that's also what I mean by the toxic milestone mentality is that, you know, let's embrace that walking down the aisle in a wedding is wonderful. It's great. But so is leaving something that's unhealthy, even though you're not married. You know, that should be equally celebrated and that these milestones are not the tell all uh, in life. No, definitely not. And, you know, I think it's safe to say that it's actually a lot easier to walk down the aisle than it is to walk away from someone you love who, you know, isn't good for you. And that's a hard thing to do. It's painful. It's agonizing. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, like I said, when I was going through a breakup at 31, it was it was interesting because there were a lot of questions like, well, why? And curiosity, um, you know, wondering if it was me, et cetera. And that really was the bulk of that. And very few people did they come forward and say, oh, I'm really glad that you did that. You know, good for you. Mm -hmm. And and it's not that they didn't care about me. It's just it's just. I think sometimes it's easier to celebrate like the cheerful and the eventful um, gatherings, but you know, it's harder to celebrate the tough stuff in life. And so I really try to champion that. It's one of those things where to validate someone else's pain, you kind of have to be in touch with your own. So if I'm not tending my wound, if I don't, if I'm not aware of my wound, as it relates to relationships, it's a lot harder for me to even acknowledge someone else's, you know, and easier to just, you know, look at it through, you know, the, the lens you were talking about where, you know, why are you leaving or whatever, rather than, you know, patting you on the back and, you know, giving you, um, kudos for having the courage to put yourself first really is what it is. It's about loving yourself. Yeah. And really just in doing that, knowing that you can and you will get through the tough times. You know, again, I keep seeing goals or I read about goals, but we don't talk about how we get through the tough spots in life. And so that's what the book's about. It's how I kind of got through that and that it was okay to be temporarily depressed. It's okay to not do anything and sit there. And that really is okay because that's life. And, you know, I read about that in just a self-deprecating way saying, you know, oh, I just spent 14 hours on the couch. And then you look at your Facebook and you see someone celebrating, you know, the birth of their second child, a bachelorette party, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. We don't have to be where we think that we should be because we're just limiting ourselves. And that's something that I would like to see a little bit more in self-help for sure. Yeah. We, uh, I think the default for us a lot of times is to compare ourselves with, with other people, where they are, what they're doing, what they're achieving. And, you know, that really is not a recipe for happiness in any way. I mean, it's always bad, 
you know, but worst of all, it's invalidating our own individuality and, you know, what we have to bring to the world. Yeah. I think in many ways, it's the people that you surround yourself with the quality that's also going to be the biggest happiness contributor. Mm. So we know what brought you to write the book. How is it you became a self-help writer? What was the path that led you there? That's a good question. And I, I'm laughing because I didn't ever have a clear cut path into self-help. But I found that when I write, my best writing, my most authentic writing came from sharing experiences of mine, experiences from where I've learned a, a lesson. And it just became something that I enjoyed doing and that there seemed to be a need for. So just different media outlets. Um, I started pitching to and writing and that really became that niche. And then obviously as I get, I got older, I realized I want to write less about, you know, achieving your goals and more about harder lessons that I've learned in life. And so that's where that shift has been taken me but um yeah it's just sort of something that i stumbled upon that i wouldn't have ever imagined myself doing per se years prior and i'm really glad that i let that unfold naturally because i enjoy it it's definitely my calling in life so i always do say if i can write and have someone laugh at me and make that one person just feel at least that one person feel less alone then mission accomplished for me so if i could have someone in my situation at a certain age say, Oh, I feel like I'm so far behind in life. And I can say, you know, it's okay. Everything will be okay. But you have to stay true to who you are and figure that out. Then, you know, then I will have felt validated in that. And I do feel validated in that. So that's, yeah, again, that's where that direction has taken me and I, I thoroughly enjoy it. So now I know you told me that you've known since second grade that you wanted to be a writer, right? So what did you envision? What, what did a, being a writer mean to you as a second grader? And how did that unfold from there? What did you envision? What did you want? Well, you know, it's funny. I, at that time, I, and I still remember this, actually. I still write Christmas cards to my second grade teacher. But my my mom was a teacher. And so she identified that. I enjoyed writing and really nurtured that and pushed me to pursue that. In addition, in the second grade, I also had a wonderful teacher. And so that was just the perfect combination. Back then, now, of course, you would have, I would have said, oh, I want to be the next Anna Martin writing the Babysitter's Club because <laughs> uh, I enjoyed reading that. Um, but at that time, I wouldn't have said self-help about breakups by right. any chance. Um, but probably something where you're invested in the story or, you know, it's something that entertains you. And so that would have been, you know, Anna Martin. But I, I grew to really love writing because I enjoyed writing in my journal. And I would do it every day, as I imagine um, most little girls would. And I enjoyed keeping those memories and being able to retain that and being able to look back and say, Oh, that's how I felt on that certain day. Mm -hmm. Now ask me where those journals are. I don't know. They are packed in my basement. Um, but I, that's where that love grew for that. Mm -hmm. So then, um, what did you study? Did you, were you like an English major or did you go into journalism? Or I actually went to school for advertising and I did double major in English. But at that time, I wanted to be a copywriter and move to New York City and write the next big ad. Mm -hmm. And when I graduated, that was in 2007. That was when the economy tanked yeah. and a lot of the advertising firms folded. And that's also when a lot of advertising and a lot of media were starting to make that shift towards digital. Mm. And so that was an interesting time because the firms that I wanted to work for were folding, not in New York City, but locally. Right. And it made me second guess that industry. So by chance, I took a job in publishing. It was in medical editing. So it wasn't anything necessarily glamorous. 
Um, so it was just kind of allowing life hap, allowing life to happen while also trying to figure out life. And I think that that's also something that I write about. You know, I just went to college to, in my head, become the next big thing with a corner office. And then suddenly, you know, the, the firms are folding and I find myself in a cubicle looking at really graphic photos of, of medical images. So I'm like, well, this isn't, this isn't how it's supposed to work out. So that was my first dose of like, that's the real world kid. And through that, through wanting to find my voice, I, you know, I consistently freelance during the evenings and during the weekends. And, you know, I still to this day do that, but that's where that kind of has taken me. And it just so again, it has been great that it's gone into self-help, but I did go to school for primarily advertising and marketing and ended up taking a detour as I realized that I enjoyed writing. I enjoyed writing for others. So kind of my personal identity came out more in that. And, you know, that's been the most fulfilling. Hmm. It's obvious that you like to write, that you enjoy it. Just, it just comes through even in the bullet points in the emails because you're very thorough and you express yourself very clearly. And I write, but I wouldn't have spent that much time on an email like you did. You know, I mean, it just, it's, 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 it's obvious. I can see it. Are you pretty high energy? Um, yes and no, you know, in my work, I definitely am. And I'm very thorough and prepared. And I am always thinking, oh, what's the worst case scenarios? So it can be kind of like that. And um, because of that, I'm over prepared. And I enjoy writing. I enjoy being thorough. I think um, I think my backup career actually will edit that me be an attorney. I think I enjoy that. Mm-hmm. And looking at all the details. Um, but at the end of the day, when I'm with people, I just want to relax and I enjoy being with friends and family, et cetera. So in that capacity, I would say, no, I'm pretty quiet, actually, contrary to what it seems like. And I, I can be pretty low key. I guess it depends on the person. Mm. Where'd you grow up? So I grew up in, in Baltimore, Maryland. What was that like? I mean, it was pretty standard. It was a pretty standard childhood. It's a, a small-ish city as compared to most. Mm. And so the joke is that it's small to more. Uh-huh. And because of that, it's a lot of networking, a lot of friends, etc. So I, I did enjoy it. And I do enjoy the area for sure. Well, and you're close to D.C. Yeah, D.C. is about an hour away. So I've worked in D.C. Um, for several years at different um, marketing firms. And I've also lived in Baltimore while still driving to D.C. So I definitely am attached to the city for sure. Mm-hmm. So do you know what your next book's going to be about? Are you... Uh, far enough to have even thought of what's next or are you still primarily focused on this work? It's a little bit of both. Um, cause I am still promoting it and mind you, it's, it's a, it's a funny story cause I'm actually currently in a relationship right now and, um, you know, promoting this book about a breakup, writing about breakups. Um, I definitely have to give credit to my significant other because he's definitely very supportive of it. Um, but it's kind of like, ah, so um, I'll give it to him for that. Um, so I am very involved in that. So I am talking to a lot of relationship bloggers, etc. in doing that. But that said, I'm, I'm writing my second book. I am on page 65. So I'm excited. It's kind of fleshing out nicely. And that book will be on the same nonfiction stance and it will be about relationships and about people across the board. So I'm excited about that. I just find 
people fascinating. I enjoy writing about it. And I enjoy writing about my experiences, which are mostly awkward and weird. Hmm. That's me. Yeah. That's how you see yourself. I do. I certainly wouldn't see myself as anything like perfect or, you know, putting on a facade. I like embracing the different curveballs that life throws at us for sure. Mm, man, it does too, doesn't it? Yeah, I would say so. And it's just what you make out of it. And if you, um, I think if you have an end goal that's too confined or too narrow, that you'll miss out on a lot of other things that happen along the way. Yeah. Going back to this toxic milestone thing, um, one of the things that I experienced um, as a young man finishing high school and going out into the world, beginning college, I, I thought there was something wrong with me because I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And I felt a lot of pressure to know what to do. And, um, and a lot of the guys I work with, you know, they feel that way. Like if they don't know what they want to do, that that means there's something wrong with them. They're deficient in some way. And it's really just a trap. It, it's, it's okay to not know. I mean, is we tend to redefine ourselves and it's really kind of crazy to expect an 18 or 20 year old to know what they want to do with the rest of their lives. It just doesn't really work that way. But that's another place where I think that self-imposed pressure comes in, in our development as human beings. Um, and I say self-imposed, but we're also like acculturated to, to function that way. You know, we're taught to be that way. For me, it was really hard. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely agree with that. And not only is it hard, but it's also very expensive if you're putting yourself through college and not knowing. Um, so I definitely have friends that have paid for that education because that's what was expected. And they either went through and they're in jobs that they don't find fulfilling. Um, or they took a pause and took a breather. One of my other best friends is just now going back and knowing that she wants to go into finance and in accounting. And I really applaud her for that. So it's kind of like just understanding that not everything is going to work out perfectly. And we have kind of like that perfect uh, pressure or that pressure to be perfect always imposed on us. And, you know, conversely, you could get a great Ivy League, Ivy League education and get the job that you know that you want. But oftentimes industries can fold um, mm -hmm. and you may know exactly, you know, what you want to do, who you want to work with, where you want to live. But there's so many factors that we can't control. And that would be a mistake to kind of not, not embrace that and not live that. So we could have it all planned out and know what we want to do and still not be able to attain that. And that's okay. Well, and you could, you could get it and then hate it, you know, you could get that job you always dreamed of and then not even like it. We just don't know what's going to happen. You know? Yeah. And I think the other thing that I do write about and I do write about in the book is happiness isn't always being smiley and laughy. I just answered the other day that my version of happiness, which is exemplified throughout, um, throughout this book is it's often messy. And my version of happiness, it's hard work. I may not be happy in the moment when I'm writing or happy in the moment when I'm working towards a goal. But ultimately, that long term is going to make me the most happiness. So I think in today's culture, we, we want that instant gratification. But we forget that we need to put in the work. We forget that, you know, we need to get through the lows. We need to experience and process our emotions to then get to the next step, whatever that may be. So happiness is not always bubble baths and glasses of wine. It may be looking at yourself and trying to figure out what's wrong with me. Where could I have been a better colleague, better 
girlfriend, better friend. So across the board. So that's also my version of happiness. Well, and my life is a pretty clear example of when something goes bad and then it can become a strength, you know, and for me, it was, you know, I drank a lot as a young adult to the point where I needed to stop. And that's how I ended up doing what I do for a living. And I never would have dreamed of doing that before, but it's, uh, so it's this skill set that I have that comes from what most people would consider a weakness, but it turned out to be a gift when I embraced it. You know, it gave me, it, it also like going back to being in touch with our wounds and really being able to, um, to be able to be there and hold space for somebody else. You really have to kind of be in tune with yourself. But I, I think that's a, an important point about all this career stuff is that things can come out of the most seemingly tragic unexpected events that could lead to great things. You just don't know. And, and ultimately to yeah. me, that's part of what really makes life cool. The mystery of it, we don't know. And we can either look at it like, Oh my God, I don't know what's going to happen. Or we can look at it like, Oh wow. Like anything could happen. Yeah. And that's very true. And I certainly wouldn't, say that that's a weakness on your behalf at all. I definitely applaud you for wanting to change lives for people. And that I felt like what that was my calling because, um, because there are women and there are people who feel like that they should be in a relationship or they should compromise parts of who they am, maybe to stay in that perfect job or to stay in that perfect friend group, mom friend group. But if it doesn't make you happy, you really need to say, you know, pull back. Hey, this isn't something that I want to do. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a lot of friends who are moms and that's great. I love hearing about their kids. I have a nephew and I love hearing about him. I love seeing him. And so it's not that I don't want to engage in conversation about uh, marriages and about kids. But conversely, there are things that even if I'm not able to relate firsthand that there's still ways to, um, you know, to be fulfilled. Oftentimes people who are married with kids is essentially what I'm trying to say is that they want that for you if they're happy, because they want you to there be ha therefore be happy. Right. They want you to have the marriage. They want you to have the kids. That's how they can relate. And so there's really nothing malicious with that. And so with writing this, um, I explain I explain that and I explain what it's like to have friends say, um, oh, it's a mother's love. I have a love for my child like people without kids wouldn't understand. And so I talk about the anxiety that I was starting to feel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I certainly would like to be a mom, but mm -hmm. is that something that I'll, I'll ever experience? I mean, you know, what a tough thing to kind of hear uh, when you're going through a breakup and you're wondering. You know, will I ever have these things? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so I think that we we sometimes get that or sometimes get those pressures, not in a malicious way, but just because, you know, maybe that person is happy in their job and they want you to find that. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of what you were talking about in your one podcast, which is a projection of that. Mm -hmm. And so... When I say that I felt like it was like the end of the world, oftentimes it's not. And it's just friends wanting to relate. So it's a criticism of comments like that, but then also a criticism of myself uh, because it wasn't anything that was mean spirited, but I was very melodramatic and very, oh, what was me in the moment? And so once I kind of backed off and realized, hey, I'm not the perfect friend either, then that made everything across the board just easier to digest all around. Well, and, you know, you were talking about people um, compromising what they wanted in the interest of their friendship group or staying in a relationship or whatever. And 
you know, ultimately there's no shortcut from being true to ourselves. I mean, it's, it's going to end up ugly if, if we're not, you know, I believe that's been my experience anyway, when I've tried to circumvent that in the interest of staying in a relationship or retaining a friendship or having the approval of my parents or whatever, you know, compromising myself in the interest of that, you know, it just didn't work, didn't pay off and doesn't definitely doesn't lead to happiness, you know, or fulfillment. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. And I am definitely a champion of um, being, being independent. I say single, but I should say independent at times too. Um, at 31 at that time. And I, I keep emphasizing that age as a female because of the pressures that we feel. But at that time, if I had not walked away from a very healthy, wonderful relationship that I am in today, and we've been together for a, about a year um, coming up. And so it's funny because when I look back, I thought that that was the end of the world. And I thought life was so tough. But in the place that I am right now, and that was after years and years of hard work um, on myself. Mm -hmm. But if I look at my life now, there really isn't anything that I would have changed um, if I hadn't gone through a layoff, which was tough, that I wouldn't have really nurtured my own writing um, in, as, as self-help. I wouldn't have launched my website or written this book per se. Mm. Your and, website is fantastic, by the way. I love it. It's just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, that was its own um, pretty intense project, but I was lucky to work with a great team. And it's it's something that I had obviously never done before. So to see the final product, I I really got lucky with the people that I worked with. So it's it's been great. I appreciate that. Yeah, the photos are great. The design. I mean, I love the the uh, typefaces. And I mean, I just it struck me. Um, so, what was the publishing um, experience like for you to get this published? Um, I, I joke to my friends, um, with writing, I think a lot of times people think that writing is very glamorous and that I just sit with like a cup of tea behind a typewriter and that it's very easy, but writing is pretty unforgiving. Mm. Um, and I say that in cause writers are rejected a lot. There's so much writing out there and there's always someone who may not be the better writer, but know more people, or maybe that person is the better writer and knows more people all around. Mm -hmm. um, but the underlying really issue is the rejection aspect of it. You can send out 50 pieces and one gets accepted and you have to rewrite it. So um, publishing in general, writing, blogging, all of that, um, it's, it's tough. And when you are rejected that many times, it's, the name of the game, but it does start to affect you. So right before I got this um, published, I was like, oh man, you know, um, th this is tough. So it's, I equate publishing and I equate um, pitching a book like dating. <laughs> and it's kind of like, you know, putting your, it's so cliche, but putting your best self out there and just going on dates and seeing what's the best match. Mm. And you're going to get rejected. Um, you're going to just not vibe well. Or you'll get these kind of like bites where you're like, oh, that's awesome. That publisher is awesome. Or if you're on a date, oh, that's really great. I hope something can come out. But then, you know, it's it's silence. Yeah. So <laughs> it's it's um that's how I say that publishing is. And I was lucky to find you know, again, that great fit, but you just have to listen to your instincts. You have to put yourself out there primarily and be who you really are, not who you think that people expect and want that mm. want of you or want you to be. And so across life, that's really what's worked best is to be who I am, to write how I talk, to write how I think. Um, and the same goes with 
you know, the different relationships along the way, be it with my website, a publisher, um, different podcasters, um, is just to be me. And that was what ended up working really, really good for me across the board. Um, although it is difficult. Not everyone likes me. So, so that's the tough thing. How many publishers would you say you submitted this to? I don't know. I, you know, I don't know offhand. Um, but this publisher in particular, um, was a, just a really great fit and the team was a really great fit. So, um, I, it's kind of again, like, like dating. Um, you may feel rejected. Um, and you know, and I say rejection, not by publishers of this book, but by editors in general, um, by people who don't think that you fit the vibe, um, in general. So, this publisher ended up just being just the perfect great fit. And I'm really glad that I um, was able to work with them. I sent out a book proposal. That was like the last thing I did before I started working on this podcast to maybe a dozen different publishers. And at that time I kind of knew it wasn't going to get picked up just because so much of, of it is what can they make money off of now? But it was important for me personally to go through that process and to be able to say I did it. And it, would, it just felt really important to do that. So, so I did. And now here I am like a year and a half later and I've done, this is episode 89 of this podcast. And I just could have never imagined that it would turn into what it has. Yeah, no, I mean, like I said, when I um, started out writing, I thought I was going to be in New York City and I certainly didn't think that I'd be doing this and it's, it's more fulfilling. So when you just ride what life gives you to, um, you know, that's really what works best. I think so. I really do. Life is just, it's, it's really cool if you let it be, you know, we can either look at these these little jaunts off course that we have, we can look at them as problematic if we want to. But if, if I was comparing my life to some plan that I devised years to, I, I could be pretty unhappy with it. But at the end of the day, like I like my life. It's attitude is really important. For sure. So you're 65 pages into the next book. So, one of the questions I always ask is if you could go back to the younger Lisa to give her some words of advice, when would she have needed that? And what would you say? Well, I really think that it would be, I think the easy answer for that would be, when I was going through my breakup, I would tell myself that what I thought was like the hardest, and I say that with melodramatics, mm -hmm. um, but you know, the hardest, isol most isolating incident um, really was going to be propel me into a healthy relationship, uh, a newfound love for, for writing. Mm -hmm. And so I would have told myself that that's okay. And that life sucks sometimes, but you have to use that to your advantage. And then I think that I would answer that question probably, I don't know, you know, in the high school or the college years when you're trying to figure out who you are and you want to just fit in, um, that I would say that what's most attractive and what will get you the most or the furthest in life is to be yourself. You know, as I touched on writing how I speak or writing who I am, not who I think people want me to be, that that will get me the furthest, that that will make me the most happy. And so I would tell myself that during, you know, high school and college, kind of the awkward times um, is is what I would what I would say, too. Well, that's just like this podcast in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, and probably let's let's be honest. I would probably tell myself in high school to get on the 
blogging and podcasting train because I would have had a media conglomerate by now. <laughs> um, but that's also, you know, didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I would have told my younger self for sure. Uh, for me, the answer would be at whatever age, just relax. It's going to be okay. You don't have to freak out. You know, you can just enjoy your life and um, it's all going to unfold the way it unfolds. And, and if we can be present for it and enjoy it, then, you know, that goes an awful long way. Yeah. And I also think that, you know, if we had that tunnel vision in life, we're going to miss out on the type of people that mm -hmm. we could potentially meet. So just like when you say that you um, had someone who was with you in radio and then you turn to publishing. Um, you know, if you think that you're going to, I don't know, um, I suppose, um, you know, be in a certain industry, you might have a mentor come up along the way that you could miss out on. Mm -hmm. And so it's really just keeping that open mind and wanting to learn all the time and keeping an open mind with relationships and with dating. Uh, maybe that one person who's, more quiet might seem um, like they're not talkative in the beginning, but they may take time to open up and that might be the most fulfilling relationship. So it's really just um, giving people a chance too. And so I always say that I need to learn how to get over myself. <laughs> and that is something that I would have told myself um, now. I would have told my younger self that too, is just get over it, get over yourself. And I joke about that consistently through my writing because not having it all, um, you know, get over it and really embrace the people around you and the quality of people around you. And that's really going to be one of the most fulfilling things too, is it whether that's through a relationship, through friendships, through family, et cetera, is just having that support network too. Yeah. I mean, ultimately that's what matters, right? Relationships and you know, a lot of times with these young guys who don't know what they want to do, um, you know, if, if you just head in that direction and you look for the people, you know, that's, that's where it's at. You know, if you find your people, you'll, you'll figure out where you belong and, you know, the path will become clear as time goes on. It's interesting. Well. This has been great. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. And um, I've enjoyed reading your book. And this has been nice. Any any parting words you'd like to, to leave us with? I guess that I would just say, um, you know, if you, especially to women, if you feel like you should be at a certain point, if you feel like your life is five steps back, it's not. And to put yourself out there that happiness is hard work and that happiness is tough spots. And this really goes to anyone in any, in any life stage. And it's really to ditch that toxic milestone mentality. And like I said, define your own version of happiness. And that really it's going to be the most fulfilling and being who you are will lead you to what you say is your authentic self. Mm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah, thank you. All right, there you go. Another episode in the books. Thanks for listening. And learn more about the show and this episode's guest at the path to authenticity.com. If you enjoy this episode, please share it with someone. Leave us a review on Apple podcasts or wherever you listen. Every little bit helps. I want to thank the band punk rock opera whose music you hear throughout the show. Their songs are used with permission from the artist and under a Creative Commons license. If you're so inclined, check out the Patreon community 
as soon as I do these interviews, I upload them to Patreon um, where the content is only available to patrons. And for just a couple bucks a month, I usually post audio content there, exclusive audio content, probably eight times a month, if not more. And as these new episodes are released, as soon as they're done, they're available to patrons. So sometimes that might be two weeks before an episode is released or even longer. Usually it's a few days. Anyway, if you want to support, if you want to support the show, that's a great way to do it. So thanks again for investing your time. It's a big deal to me. Thank you for supporting me and supporting the show. I hope you keep coming back. Be nice. That's our story. I hope you enjoyed the punk rock opera. And we have one last piece of music for you. It goes like this.
Thank you. Good night.